Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. So, first, welcome to the Biodiversity Information Standards Tagrid 2020 Conference. This is session CO02, Contributed Oral 2. And I am your moderator, Paula Sarmoglio. I'm greeting you from Bariloche, Argentina. My co-moderator is Shanina Sica from the United States. And we're very grateful for the technical support of Holly Little, also from the US, and Beatriz Lujan from Canada. But this session will be recorded for later viewing. I thank you all for joining us. And I thank you, uh, I thank the speakers in this session. Um, please be aware that the chat function has been made available for technical questions and for conversing with other attendees. Please use the chat judiciously as any nefarious or inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. So please also read our code of conduct for more information. We will put the link in the chat. Uh, during this session, you may ask questions in the chat while the speakers are presenting, or you can also capture them in a shared document. You will also find a link to that document in the chat. Um, please keep your microphones uh, muted. We will have a discussion time before the end of the session, and during that time you will be able to speak if you wish. In that case, please uh, first raise your hand. You can go to the participants list menu there. You click more and raise your hand, or you can type slash hand in the chat. Well, thank you, everyone. We will now start with our first speaker. So our first speaker is Roderick Page from the University of Glasgow in the UK, who will talk to us about strategies for assembling the biodiversity knowledge graph. Roderick, all yours. Okay, so <clears throat> hello everybody. I hope you can uh, hear me and see me. Um, so my talk is going to be on uh, knowledge graphs. So I guess what I should do to start with is define what I mean by knowledge graph. So let me just get myself out of the way just a little bit. This is what I mean by a knowledge graph. It's the idea that there are lots of things that we're interested in in biodiversity, publications, people, institutions, localities, specimens, species, and so on. And we've done a really good job of digitizing those. We haven't done such a great job of digitizing the connections. And the argument is if we could make the connections between all these different entities, we could start to do some really interesting things. So I guess my question is, how do we go about doing that? So one approach is to make what I'm gonna call um, local knowledge graphs. So the idea here is that you get some data and you assemble it. And here are a couple that I sort of picked out. Um, one down here, this is a knowledge graph called Ozymandias, which is uh, based on Australian biodiversity. And there's one up here called Open Biodiv, which is run by Pensoft. Now, both these knowledge graphs are sort of local in the sense that they are fairly restricted in what they cover, you know, Australian animals or publications from Pensoft. So this is, this is one approach to building these knowledge graphs. And you can have a lot of fun doing this because you can sort of act as being in control of that data and assembling it. The, the small scope means you can assemble very densely, richly informative um, knowledge graphs. But there are problems. I mean, these two graphs actually, uh, even though they're about essentially the same things, aren't really closely linked. In fact, they're more or less incompatible. So those causes problems. So another approach to making the knowledge graph is to go global. And in this case, we're looking here at something like Wikidata. If you haven't come across Wikidata, Wikidata is one of our wiki projects. It's a huge knowledge graph. It's free, it's open, and anybody can edit it. It's got about 90 million items, all with a characteristic Q number. And there's something like a billion edits have been made to this knowledge graph. 
Now, if you haven't come across the Wikidata yet, you will be probably very, very soon. A number of biodiversity projects are including it. So for example, here is David Shorthouse's wonderful uh, binomia project. David is trying to link people with the specimens that they collected and identified. In this case here, we've got uh, the late Vicky Funk. Here she is here, and here are some of the places that she has um, been involved in working. Now, David needed an identifier for, Vic for Vicky, and what he's used is the Wikidata ID down here. It serves as a really useful identifier for people, particularly if they don't have ORCID IDs. So you'll find Wikidata in situations like this where people need identifiers. But Wikidata is sort of invading many more sites. There is a, um, a wonderful project called Entity Explosion. And this is by a guy called Toby Hudson. So what Toby is trying to do is to bring Wikidata pretty much everywhere. And what it is, this is a browser extension that, um, a browser extension that you can use in Chrome and Firefox. And essentially, if you go to a website and click on that extension, it will tell you um, something about uh, that particular site. So here's a sort of classic taxonomy website. This is for a publication. Publication apparently is in Russian. There are no links anywhere for that publication, but if you click on this wonderful little uh, icon that Toby provides, suddenly we see, oh look, there's the paper, it's in Russian, and there's a the DOI, and all this is coming from Wikidata. So Wikidata is becoming increasingly useful in that regard and increasingly accessible. Now, having said that, if you go to Wikidata, uh, the user experience is not great. So this is the Wikidata page, and basically it's just a list of facts that you can edit, which is cool, but it's really hard to get a sense of what's available. So one thing I've been messing about with is trying to come up with a way to make Wikidata more kind of accessible and sort of a way to navigate it. So I've written a little app here. This is called ALEC. It stands for um, a list of everything cool. Happens to be my son's name as well, so that's entirely coincidental. But the idea here is to provide a simple way to kind of get a sense of what's available in Wikidata. So I just want to show you a, a couple of screenshots. So for example, here's a taxon. This is a genus of New Zealand cicadas. Here's the genus up here, here are all the species, the pictures come from Wikidata. You've got some links to identifiers, GBIF and EOL and GenBank and iNaturalist. And over here is a list of the people who edited or contributed to that page. Now, typical with the wiki world, these are not real people's names. We can figure some of them out down here. For example, this is Ambrosia 10, which is Siobhan Leachman, who's contributed to this page. So you can view taxa. This is a scientific paper, and it is just lit up in green, lots and lots of lovely orchid IDs. And lastly, um, their taxonomy seems to be a bit of a theme here. This is uh, Norman Platnick, another titan of taxonomy who we lost in the last year. Here is a picture, here are some identifiers, and here is publications. And this is all information from Wikidata. So I guess where I'm sort of going with this is it seems kind of inevitable that if we want to have this knowledge graph linking this information, then Wikidata seems to be a really good place to start. It already has lots of taxa, lots of people, and publications, it has museums and collections and so on. It's constantly growing. There are lots of people contributing to it and making it grow from wiki species, uh, various bots and various enthusiasts. So I think the question is really becoming not how to assemble this knowledge graph, but how to make best use of one that's assembling itself uh, in the form of Wikidata. So I guess you can probably get the sense that I'm an enthusiast and I think Wikidata is gonna be incredibly important and we're sort of you know, getting this knowledge graph almost for free, but there are some issues. And I just wanna to touch on one of them that's been a bit of an obstacle um, in the work that I've been doing, which is how you incorporate taxonomy into this knowledge graph. So here's an example. So one of the things I was really keen on doing uh, is having a simple kind of hierarchical view of the classification of a particular kind of species. You know, the kind of thing you might see in, in GBA for iNaturalist. And it turns out that that's kind of hard to get from Wikidata. So just to give you an example, here's a frog. And this is a frog that's in the family Leptodactylidae. 
So if you're a site like GBIF, you get a classification like, okay, here's the family, it's a kind of frog, a frog is an amphibian, an amphibian is a chordate, and a chordate is an animal. And you get a nice kind of linear path from your species or taxon of interest to the root. But if you go and look at Wikidata, you'll see an extraordinary range of things here. Basically, paleontologists have gone completely to town and sort of come up with multiple classifications. So there's an issue here that there's this Wikidata, it gets being community assembled, lots of people have different classifications, and it's gonna be a bit of a challenge to try and work through all those. So the other sort of thing, and I guess sort of one of the things that I'm looking at going next with this is Wikidata is quite different and knowledge graphs are quite different from lots of classical kind of biodiversity um, databases. So for example, if we've got something like GBO for our naturalist, we can measure pro progress quite easily in terms of uh, numbers of things. You know, GBIF has over a billion things. iNaturalist has over 10 million uh, citizen science observations. Um, I've contributed something like quarter of a million edits to Wikidata. So that's, that's a number, but what does that mean? And I think the problem here is, is rather than just counting things, we really want to get a sense of how connected that knowledge graph is, because that's how we're going to get some utility from this, is the interconnections. And so one thing I'd be kind of interested in is how would you actually do that? And maybe we could sort of go back to these knowledge graphs. We go back to Open Biodev and Ozymandias and things like that. We could use them to calibrate or get a sense of how, you know, what a really strongly interconnected knowledge graph might look like. So that's pretty much a sort of whirlwind tour of, of the current state of some of these knowledge graphs. I just want to leave you with a, a couple of um, links that you might be interested in. So one is to this, this Alec demo, this browser of Wikidata to explore. And I strongly recommend you have a look at Entity Explosion, which is Toby Hudson's new toy, which is basically bringing Wiki, Wikidata everywhere. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, Rob, very much. Uh, we had a comment from the audience that some of the slides were a little blurry. It might have been a bandwidth issue. So we wanted to ask you if it would be fine to share your presentation with them. Yes, of course. Sorry about the blurriness. Not quite sure what happened there, but um, I can obviously make the slides available to anybody who wants them. So we have a, a comment, a question in the chat right now that says, you claim that Wikidata is the way to go for assembling scientific data. How do you imagine referencing Wikidata in a scientific publication? That's a good question. I guess it uh, depends on what you mean by referencing Wikidata. Obviously you can reference the entire project essentially with the URL. Um, the way you use Wikidata is often you will do a query. You may, that query may deliver a set of data back to you. Um, for example, list of species in a certain area. Uh, you could archive that query result, um, put it in an archive, put a DOI on it, and refer to that as that particular analysis that you've done. I think the, the, the question is probably getting at the idea that obviously Wikidata is growing and dynamic and with any dynamic database, you're gonna have the issue that, that to reproduce the results. So one way is simply to archive the result of those queries. So then we have another question that says, how to measure graphs? Will not ne network ecology metrics work here? Nest nets and et cetera. Um, not totally sure I follow, but, but yes, there are, there are various ways you can measure things like connectivity in the graph, um, richness of connections, those sorts of things, uh, which also pop up in lots of different contexts. So those are the kind of things I'm, I'm interested in. Um, you know, to what extent are, are people and species and all these other things connected? How easy is it to go from different um, points, which is, is how you're gonna generate sort of rich, rich kind of queries. One practical problem we have at the moment with things like Wikidata is for example, we have tens of thousands of taxonomists, many of those taxonomists in Wikidata are not connected to the publications or the tax that they've described. So we could have measures of that kind of lack of connection and then figure out how we can improve that. 
And we have some more, some more questions coming in the chat. Um, <laughs> this one um, is, is kind of broad, but I'll let you answer. Do you think the issue regarding taxonomy with data, uh, with, with Wikidata, sorry, will ever be solved? We, do we need more taxonomists involved with Wikidata? Um, I guess it depends what you think a solution will look like. Um, what is likely to happen, and, and Wikidata kind of supports this, is you can have multiple classifications. I think part of the issue is, is people have different classifications. So what we're going to need is some tool which can um, perhaps pick out different individual classifications that each one might be a tree while letting the thing as a whole not be a tree, which is the problem because you have this kind of thing. I would certainly encourage more taxonomists to get involved. Um, it's an interesting experience uh, it, because it's a community different project. Um, you may experience a very different kind of environment to say contributing to say GBIF or a naturalist or something else like that. Okay, I'll pass you to the next uh, question. Thank you, Rod. And uh, that is, are you aware of anyone setting up their own wiki based instances in order to represent their, their graphs, their biodiversity knowledge graphs? The answer to that is yes. So um, Wikibase is the software underlying Wikidata. So if you wanted to, you could engage with, directly with Wikidata, which is what I'm doing. Or if you want to have the same kind of system, um, but do it yourself, you can do that. So there are cases where people have taken the software and set it up and, and experimented with that locally to get a sense of what they can do with that. I guess one advantage of that is if you disagree, say, with the way Wikidata does things, you can do it how you'd like to do it. Okay, and I will pass you one last question before we go to the next speaker. And there is already an answer from, from another of the attendees in the chat. The question is, how does Wikidata deal with dissent? In, in several ways. I mean, Wikidata records uh, these individual facts, these individual statements. So this is more than one um, statement for there might be disagreement about it. You can record both values. Um, it strongly encourages linking those to references to sources. Um, it can accommodate, for example, multiple taxonomic classifications because every taxon can have more than one parent taxon. Uh, in the case of that frog example that I showed, that enormously complex classification was because people don't agree on the classification. So it, it might not be dissent, but you can certainly have multiple um, values for things, ideally all reference with some source to back that up. Thank you very much, Rod, to all attending. We will have time for more questions uh, at the end of the session, but now we're going to go into our next speaker. Thank you very much, Rod.